Namaste and welcome to my video blog. This is Abhinav Prakash. And today we have with us a very special guest, which most of you already know, Abhijit Ayamitra, defense analyst and a senior fellow at the International Peace and Conflict Studies. Abhijit, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Abhinav. So today we are going to discuss something very interesting, you know, and which is called industrialization. We all talk about industrialization. Our policymakers have been talking about it. We study about it in school that how the West was able to industrialize and India could not and third world countries cannot. You have different Marxist theories, institutional theories. You have different even racist theories about it that somehow the Westerners are genetically superior so they were able to do that. So we are going to discuss these things that what exactly is industrialization and what does it entail and can India ever catch up? So Abhijit, starting, to, starting with the first question itself, what exactly do we mean by industrialization? What, what is this phenomenon all about? Okay. So see, the thing is, industrialization is, for me, um, and I think for most anthropologists, is the application of chemical energy to the production process. Right? And many people confuse this with scale. You know, you can have potters making pottery. You can have uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of people together, like the Ming Imperial Porcelain Factory. Or you can have uh, hundreds of thousands of slaves uh, working off in a coal mine. That doesn't make it industry. And, you know, the problem in India is several historians like Irfan Habib, Romila Thapar and Co. They claim that scale is industry. Scale is not industry. Industry and industrialization very specifically start with the use of coal energy to uh, 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 the industry, uh, to a production process. And then they move on to, you know, other fossil fuels. So uh, 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 diesel, petrol and things like that. And now, of course, you have nuclear energy. So it's basically what it does, for example, the earliest use of coal was to pump water out of uh, coal shafts. And it was the most logical thing to do because you're producing the coal out there. And they discovered that, you know, there was this water pump because one of the things in England when you are digging for coal is because it's so rainy, the water tends to accumulate. And you needed to keep draining these tunnels of water so that the miners could, you know, uh, uh, extract the coal. And what would happen is that you had, uh, they discovered this coal engine, which would then suck the water out through vacuum and pressure. Uh, and it was fantastic because for a human being, it required them to keep taking buckets out, keep bucketing things out. Whereas here, what you had was a pipe, which was sucking all the water out. And it was fantastic because it did it in a much, much more efficient way. So the efficiency increases manifold because see your total energy, if you look at it mathematically, the total energy available on earth for a normal physical process as opposed to a chemical process, which is to say a human being doing things, is the sun radiates a certain amount of energy onto earth. The earth processes it and it produces uh, crops which you eat. In that process, a lot of energy is lost. Then when you eat, only part of the energy gets absorbed into your body. Most of it gets lost. And then there is only that amount of energy that you can expend on a physical process that you do, like bucketing water out or lifting a rock. Whereas with chemical energy, the loss is much, much less. It's focused to that particular point, like say a coal engine or a coal water removal uh, machine. And the benefits are extraordinary. If you want to do a simple, simple experiment, what I'd suggest is, you know, if your car gets stuck in a, uh, uh, a pothole, to push it out, you will require at least 10 to 15 human beings to start pushing it. On the other hand, it doesn't matter if you've even got a Maruti 800, a little underpowered car. You know, you push it bumper to bumper and push that car back. It'll happen like that in like two seconds. That is the difference between chemical energy and physical energy. And that it is the application of that which is called industrialization. Yeah, I mean, lots of people, in fact, do confuse between the scale and the basics. So if you remember 
in this farmers protest i have been talking about capitalist farmers aviji and people like that how can how can farmers can be capitalist because only adani and ambani can be capitalist they don't understand it's about the basics is about what defines capitalism not about the scale so i think that confusion always also pervades the entire discourse on the industrialization i think we need to remember that for most of history uh, all elites were farmers till industrialization set in slave owners were farmers the entire slave trade was based on cotton farming and sugar farming uh, in the west indies and the americas and in brazil so you know this notion that farmers are somehow this benign non capitalistic the foundations of capitalism were laid by farmers by the accumulation of farm surpluses by uber farmers if you want to call it that who controlled enough production that they could specialize then in warfare or something like that but they were always farmers all wealth well most wealth prior to the industrial revolution was farm based agricultural surpluses <laughs> other than you know trade <laughs> so uh, so we are talking about industrialization so uh, there are scholars you are mentioning ifan habib and many people they have contended that it was india and china who were the best candidate of industrial revolution let's say in the 17th century but it somehow happened in the west you know what's your take on that do you really think that india or even china was on their way to have industrial revolution some kind of that or is is just you know that's a uh, i think we are being too romantic as we always are about our own past um you know these um uh history these what if histories you know what if darashiko had become emperor instead of aurangzeb i'm just amazed that these kind of things are even taken seriously you know these alternate histories they belong to fiction not to reality reality would dictate that where you had a manpower shortage that is where mechanization would first come in out of sheer necessity right so with china and india you never realistically had the need for mechanization because for anything it didn't matter if four or five people broke their backs uh, you know carrying the stone out because you had overpopulation human life was cheap work was very easily done by man part even today why don't we mechanize why does the farmer do back breaking labor because there's too much labor right uh, uh why don't most indian houses own a vacuum cleaner it's because you've got somebody to come and sweep and swab and everything and you don't need to, uh, something expensive that costs about 12 13000 rupees to suck up uh things even though it does a different function this is the way people look at it in india a lot of people in india still have people coming over to wash their clothes instead of just buying a washing machine right so th- there's it is usually a paucity of human beings that would given the most impetus to both innovation and to mechanization and you look at this traditionally uh you know egypt for example was always overpopulated initially it led to a spurt of innovation but after that it sort of becomes the breadbasket for greece rome persia and all the other innovations start coming from there not from the overpopulated regions right uh in uh, greece for example why was slavery so important because the population was so small you needed slaves to come do the work because if you go to greece you realize it's very hilly arid uh, mountainous land you can't grow much uh, norway is quite similar but that is why they started plundering outside you know the viking expeditions and things like that in both norway and greece it is seafaring that is easier because the fjords the uh, Uh, you know the sea inlets are so sharp and deep land transport doesn't make sense so you develop sea transport so the 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 notion that a human surplus society would find a way of getting rid of its biggest asset which was the human surplus is honestly quite laughable because it just goes against every principle of human innovation historically Sure. let's say if you bring in ian morris and he talks about these things and he says that is the uh, crisis caused by ever expanding population which basically drove the invention and innovation and what you are saying that that doesn't matter because if you look at the europe in the 17th century it was very much overpopulated and that was you know the, the living standards were falling 
the conditions were terrible in all the cities of the Europe, Western Europe. And that basically led to this entire thing of innovation. But what you are saying does not match us with what Ian Morris is saying. Right. So the thing here is Ian Morris is partially right that the greater the pool, the greater the population pressure, the greater the uh, thrust to innovation. But remember something that happened in Britain at this period of time. You're also looking at a significant accumulation of capital, right? And now for capital, you want to use more and more efficient means of production because you want to save money, right? In Asia, that concept of saving money, uh, you know, cutting down on uh, uh, labor and things like that, that simply didn't exist at that point. So it's the, it's the intersection of two separate things. It is pure capitalism coming to roost plus a population, in, population pressure in that sense, right? We also need to remember that in the 1700s, when the bulk of the industrial revolution takes place in England, England lost one quarter of its population. Uh, there were severe famines. There were, uh, because, you know, there was this explosion of a... Uh, Icelandic volcano, which caused massive climate change effects throughout Europe. So you actually had this thing where in the earlier part of the 17th century, you had this uh, 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 population boom. Uh, if you actually look at it, there was a lot of these feudal, uh, well, the nobility seizing the commons lands. So that was also one of the highest times of highway brigandage and things like that. And there was the need for these lords and ladies to sort of reduce their dependence on human labor. And at any rate, that human labor was never as free and available as it was in the East. The East always had a massive, massive surplus of human labor. But curiously enough, in the West, you also see that sudden decline in human labor that happens because of that volcanic explosion. Um, and it's very surprising because not many history books, even Ian Morris doesn't talk about this uh, volcanic explosion, that you know, a quarter of your population lost to unnatural circumstances. When it happens in uh, uh, the USSR, we call it the Holomdor, the famine. Uh, you call it the Bengal famine, which are all caused by rapid industrialization in a short period of time. Here, nobody actually talks about it because they lost a quarter of their population over a hundred year period. So when it gets, when the uh, period gets expanded, it uh, tends to sort of mask the gravity of the loss. And that's an interesting thing. I, I didn't know about it. Uh, but do you think this this entire discovery of the new world also caused a change and made the Western Europe the better candidate for industrial revolution? Because you have this plunder coming from across the Atlantic, and they were already colonizing India by that time. By the time industrial revolution begins in India, you know, I mean, uh, you see uh, that uh, uh, when did the British won the uh, Bengal? 1757, Battle of Plassey, right? Battle of Plassey. And within 10 years, you know, these people were having heavy industries being set up. So what is happening? They have got taxation power over a population almost as large as the British population. So there was lots of plunder flowing in from the colonies, from India, from Asia, from Americas, which led to this, what you call initial capital accumulation. Do you think that played a role and that is not available to countries like India? Uh, no, because see, that doesn't hold up to statistical probability. I'll tell you why. The biggest uh, uh, booty coming in was Spain and Portugal from the Americas, right? Why didn't they industrialize? They remained non-industrial right up to the 50s, 1950s, uh, so the 20th century, basically. Why did, for example, uh, Germany industrialize? Germany didn't really have colonies. Namibia, there's nothing much to be extracted. I mean, there's diamonds, but that uh, one industry alone can't fuel this. So, you know, again, these are very, very simplistic theories, you know, like Shashi Tharoor, I know, has done a quite a valiant job trying to say that it was Indian plunder that uh, 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 sparked off the Industrial Revolution wrong. He confuses the symptom with the cause. I think what people don't realize is Britain followed a mercantilist policy and people confuse mercantilism with capitalism. And they're two completely different things. In fact, mercantilism is a corrosion of capitalism. It's crony capitalism. It's, it's not staying true to the purpose of capital, right? 
So you, you have too many European countries industrializing at the same point of time who do not have access to these colonies or excess capital coming in, plunder capital coming in from the colonies to spark this industrialization. So there's, there's a fundamental gap here between cause and effect. Did it make industrialization easier? Yes, of course. You know, uh, uh, capital growing out of the air always makes capital, uh, capitalization easier, uh, industrialization easier. But it is not the sole cause. I think these are very simplistic monocausal explanations that we like to come up with, especially Indian historians love to come up with because, you know, being such a pathetic footnote in history, we like to overbloat our sense of importance. I mean, you just triggered lots of people, pathetic footnote of history. Why would you say that? <laughs> uh, tell me one great innovation outside the zero that's come from India. I think in 730 AD, when we uh, undeniably invented the zero, we were so taken in with the zero that we collectively decided to reduce ourselves to zero. Uh, and since then, we've not really produced any uh, mechanical, scientific, philosophical innovation worth its salt. You tell me one. You know, I can show you pre, uh, uh, like the uh, iron at uh, uh, the um, uh, Gupta pillar in the Qutub Minar. Uh, that is sophisticated, but that is pre-700. Uh, you know, we can talk about the lavatories and the drainage system of Harappa, but that again is way uh, ahead. Tell me one great scientific innovation that comes out of India after that. Aryabhata, all these people were before that. There's nothing that comes out of India after that. Well, that's, that has always been a very strong indictment of the Islamic rule in India. I think those theories are true that you know, that really uh, uh, hampered India's intellectual growth. But I go a step back. I think we were already stagnating before the Islamic invasions happened in India. So that is also very simplistic that India was destroyed and everything stagnated because of the Turks and the Mughals. But I think India was already not being really great before then, you know, for a couple of centuries, we were stagnating. Exactly. And I think what you're seeing is that the post Gupta period saw a de-urbanization of India. Now, you know, urbanization is the root of innovation, one of the roots of innovation. The moment, so by the time, by the period of Harshavardhana and things like that, you did have cities, but you had largely become a de-urbanized population. And you see this with Rome. All its greatness comes when it when it can sustain these large urban centers. The moment it sort of uh, de-urbanizes in that sense, uh, these become, you know, uh, uh, th there is no innovation coming out of there, right? And so to connect this back to the point that you made about Ian Morris saying, you know, population pressure, it's not just population pressure. Remember what a city does is it brings together a lot more different ideas that can be synthesized and fused. It acts as that sort of social medium for innovation. So it's, it's a lot more complex than just saying, uh, because if population pressure were the driver of innovation, then modern India with 1.3 billion people on a landmass that can only sustain about two to 300 million people should be the, um, sorry, quote unquote, Vishwa guru of innovation. And they're really not. So, you know, population by itself, population booms by themselves, don't explain innovation that way. Well, yeah, I agree to this. And well, the civilizations are always about cities. This is what people don't realize. The very definition of civilization is the urban settlements, the emergence of the urban areas. Somehow in India, we confuse civilization with your village level uh, culture, you know. That's culture, that's not civilization. But I agree because even today, you see in the modern world, all the research and innovation technology are, are highly concentrated in the urban areas everywhere in the world. And there are deep anthropological economic reasons for that, why cities are the engines of technological growth. But this is what we see. The industrialization always goes side by side with urbanization. Right? Yeah. So let me come to India at this point. Why in Indian policy making do we confuse the both? Why this obsession to do you know, uh, uh, the village level industrialization, all these things, you know, you read the technology, history of technology in India, we have always been obsessed in the policy making with the appropriate technology, which can benefit the masses, which can you know, do equitable kind of uh, industrialization. Why we don't understand that it's only the some centers 
large urban centers they can grow first before you know dragging other people around you know we've been very good uh, civilizationally we've been very good at abstraction we've never been good at the practical you know only a civilization like india could come up with a zero but only a civilization like china could come up with cannons and uh, uh, bombs right because the chinese have always focused on practicality india has always focused on uh, uh, abstraction let me give you a simple example uh, you know uh, you will find that there uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, philosophical thing about the 16 kinds of happiness you know there is the happiness you feel for your father there is the happiness you feel for your mother there is the happiness that you feel when you lay with your wife there is the happiness that you feel when you lay with another man's wife so you know fantastic at classifying happiness but then when you look at say garuda or jatayu it was an eagle it was a vulture what kind of vulture was it a uh, uh, you know uh, was it a condor was it a golden uh, eagle was it a uh, 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 pariah kite was it a fishing eagle what was it was it a crested eagle no eagle bus even though there are clear physical differences between eagles kites and whatever we don't even get into classifying falcons kites and eagles separately right so this shows you this obsession with and this has to do i think when you go back to the philosophical roots of this it's a very deep malaise in india because you look at western philosophy it comes from the greek point of view that when you die you go into the nether world and so what happens in the afterlife is completely separated from the current life and what you do in the current life people should talk about you on earth in india because we've got these re, uh, 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 punarapi jananam punarapi maranam uh, this thing you know the um, karma and the rebirth cycles it's very easy to push things away to tomorrow everything gets abstract you know it's like that musical uh, any tomorrow tomorrow it's always a day away so you know you don't do what you need to do today you keep pushing it off to tomorrow and you get into these abstractions and pointless philosophy that becomes highly problematic when you're running a state um and unfortunately there's no way of getting out of it so getting back to your question but but you were just speaking like abhijit ayer mitra wendy doniger so abhijit ayer wendy doniger right Uh, i think wendy doniger would all be penis 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 i think wendy doniger has a penis obsession uh, so um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh she really does if you go to her house she's got everything in her house is apparently shaped like a penis uh um but anyway away from bendy doniger back to this this is what happens when you have third raters writing your history for a whole generation for all our generations to have understood that industrialization was about scale as explained by irfan habib imagine the kind of poison you Uh, and you know the conditioning of the thought process that you've made to everybody that's read in indian history at that point okay for you to consistently live on these shashi tarurian fantasies that the british uh, industrialization was spurred on by india's uh, surplus capital again such a load of rubbish you know these simplistic monocausal explanations which basically lack the complexity and nuance of a proper academic discourse that are just made anthropologically wrong factually wrong we don't go back to first principles and understand these things because it suits our ego that britain was built on indian capital we accept it because it flatters our ego to say that you know india had the highest per capita income and we were industrialized prior to the 1700s we accept the irfan habib school of thought now the point is you can keep claiming that india had a higher per capita income the problem was that if you had a historical gini coefficient it was atrocious 70% of the mughal empire's wealth was concentrated in the hands of 655 families right just 655 families there is no way that the remaining if you uh, divide the remaining 30% up between the rest of the population there is absolutely no way that you're even remotely close to the human standards 
that France, Northern Italy, Southern Italy, Germany, Holland, Britain enjoyed at this point of time. You were way, way be, be, uh, uh, behind. And this was what, uh, you know, this kind of uh, feudalism did, that concentration of wealth, the, the wealth capture at the top was so severe. And this, of course, is a product of the kind of ossification of society we see sometime around 500 to 700 AD, which is when you also become vulnerable to Turkish invasions. Before that, you could repel Turkish invasion. You did. After that, you find yourself single-handedly incapable. And think about this, Abhina. Why is it? It's not just Hindus that are unable to repel Turkic invasions. It's also the Muslim dynasties who come here, who get acclimatized to India and turn Indian, who are then unable to deal with Turkic invasions when they come from outside. The same way Lodi is unable to deal with the Mughals when they come from outside. The same way that uh, uh, Muhammad Shah Rangila is unable to deal with Nadir Shah when he comes from uh, outside. The same way, well, I mean, uh, the Marathas are unable to deal with Ahmed Shah Dali. What is it? See, it is not the fact that you, uh, Hindus were unable to do it. It is a fact that Indians or people that had gone native we're unable to do it to people coming from the steppes. And that is what you need to look at. So it, it's all a sort of interconnected continuum. So I agree to this point. So you, uh, you see, when you talk about the Mughal uh, rule in this country, uh, uh, we see lots of grand palaces, you know, we see Taj Mahal, but we don't see public works. We don't see universities. Mm -hmm. And that shows the nature of the wealth accumulation and the character of the elite as well, because it was a foreign elite. I mean, uh, with all due respect to all the seculars out here, the Mughals were never considered them, uh, considered to be natives of India up until the 18th century, I would say, you know. You, 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 can, you can read the uh, uh, exchange of the letters between uh, Bhau and the Ahmed Shah Abdali, where Abdali is insisting that they are, Mughals are not Indians, why are you worried about it? You know, that I'm coming to punish them. And Bhau is saying, yes, it is true, they're not Indians, but after so many centuries, we considered them to be Indian princes. So this is that, you know, the Mughals were never considered to be Indians and they themselves also did not consider themselves to be Indian up until a very late time. But coming to your point, Abhijit, you just pointed out why did France and Portugal didn't industrialize? Because they were also very feudal society. In Portugal. France industrialized. Huh, uh, in France, France, because, you know, the uh, French Revolution was a direct byproduct of industrialization. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, let's get uh, Spain and Portugal. Yeah. Spain and Portugal, sorry. So uh, because all the wealth flowing from all these treasure fleets coming from Latin America went in the hand of this feudal gentry, which basically spent it on all this kind of conspicuous uh, consumption, not on the investment purpose. But then you, you have this person, Barrington Moore, uh, who talks about India in his famous book, The Social Origin of Democracy and Dictatorship. And he says that because of the Mughal rule in India, the character of the political structure, it was impossible for India to you know, become a more democratic country or become a modern country. And also because of India's social system based on caste. Both of them came together to make sure that India could not jump from you know, late early modern era to the modern era. What's your take on it? What was the role of the social structure? So two things. What is the role of the social structure in enabling industrialization? or hampering it? And how does that industrialization impact the social structure? Right. So uh, both the uh, ongoing and then the reverse process. So see, social structures, remember, Europe's social structure wasn't that very different from India in the feudal period, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, peasants weren't allowed to wear a certain kind of cloth. They could only wear brown and gray cloth. Uh, if they wore anything above their station, they were whipped. Traders could only, and I would really recommend your viewers uh, uh, watch Barbara, uh, read Barbara Tukman, uh, The Calamitous 14th Century, where you get to see how different these classes were treated, what the burden of proof was. You know, it was exactly like a caste system in the sense, and it was dictated by birth, right? Even social mobility was highly limited in those days. Uh, uh, the, the restrictions went on your food, on your clothing, on everything, right? Now, in spite of that, what you, what you find is what are the main events that sort of pushed this thing? The first was the Black Death. In you know, the Black Death, what it does is it wipes off, wipes off about one third of Europe's population. 
And from there, you have this sort of uh, reformation. This uh, lack of faith in the church, which then leads to the Protestant uh, 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 revolution, and a whole load of innovation that comes about in Switzerland and Holland because of uh, that. The second great trauma that you have is in the 1600s, where you have the uh, uh, Thirty Years' War, which was again so devastating, it sort of reorganized the entire social fabric of Europe. Now, you know, when one third of your population dies, it sort of reorganizes social public and this is what europe did very very successfully in that sense right but remember it, it it's just sheer dumb luck at times but here's the point the social structures in britain were very different from the social structures in say austria in the 1700s the economic structures were different uh, uh, than say germany in the 1800s yet why do these people, why does Western Europe consistently industrialize and why does the East fail to industrialize? I can show you about 16, 17 different variations in Europe at the time, all of whom industrialized. In Asia, you have those same 16, 17 uh, uh, variations, different ones, where it prevents industrialization. Right? I'm not willing to accept that somehow Mughal polity made industrialization impossible because there was nothing how was it that the parsis were able to come and industrialize their community if those same social things applied here how is it for example that uh, the british were able to industrialize bengal right there's issues here you uh, i don't buy this argument completely it, it's more a all things not intersecting at the same time. No, but no, the no, reverse no. effect. Let, let me cut. You're saying the Mughal polity can't be held responsible and you are quoting Parsis in the British. That's the whole point. Parsis were able to do that when the British rule started in India. Yes. So why then the other societies in India able to do it? Hmm. The Jews, the Sassoons did it. The Parsis, the, uh, all the Tatas and Co and the Bhatli boys and the Petits did it. Why were, and the Wadiyas did it, why were Hindus not able to do it? Why were Muslims not able to do it? But I think in Bengal, uh, the Hindus, especially the father or the grandfather of Rabindranath Tagore, he started setting up industries out there. But what we found it was very interesting. And we need to remember, a lot of it was forced industrialization as well. And the most chronic example of that was Bengal in the Second World War, which also led to the Great Bengal Famine. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, there is a very specific reason why industrialization happens. How is it that Africa never industrialized? Hmm. I mean, they didn't suffer Mughal rule. Why is it that Iran didn't industrialize till the, uh, 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 till the 1950s, realistically? Uh, so, you know, th th there's a reason to this. It is also called a leadership determined to industrialize. Japan remained feudal up to 1870. Remember that. It was only in 1870 where Commodore Perry goes up and opens up Japan. Uh, Japan was even behind us because they'd shut down all foreign contact. They didn't even know what was happening abroad. And yet within the space of 30 years, they grow so powerful that they take on the Russian fleet in 1905, just 35 years after, and they defeat the Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima. Right? So why couldn't India pull that off? There's, there's a fundamental explanation here, uh, which uh, it, it's probably too complex, but it probably has a lot to do with the fact that we never live in the here and the now. Even today, you know, economic policy, we've got such a bizarre explanation for it. Nobody wants to focus on what's good economics or bad economics. It's always a partisan take on economics. If I do it, it's good. If you do it, it's bad. Like you're seeing with the pharma protests. The same people that supported all these laws today are at the forefront of opposing these laws today. Right? Uh, in Japan, you didn't have that. In Iran, you didn't have that. Maybe a dictatorship helps. Right? Uh, in India, it was also a lack of coordinated... Uh, rule because you didn't have a single political unit called India at that point of time. 
uh, that brings us to a very important point, Abhijit, that industrialization, as uh, we see, is a very complex process. It's a very chaotic process, right? It, it, it really causes lots of stress in the society, lots of chaos, violence. It's an extra ordinary violent process. And it always needs a very strong state to manage it. And you just said, we never had this unified Indian state to do that. I mean, under Indian rule, we had it under the British, but not under the Indians. Uh, how do you, you know, uh, rate the effectiveness of Indian state, or let's say the ability of the Indian state to manage this process? Because I think Indian state does not even exist on the ground. We are so understaffed at every level. We just don't have public employment in this country. We don't have people to run the state mechanism. And still people come and say, you know, cut down the government, cut down the government, uh, shut down this, shut down that. How does that work? Why does this, you know, anti-state mentality, why this typical Indian mentality of living in some remote corner in a forest? It's actually that we have too much government, but we have the employment in all the wrong sectors. Right. Uh, what happens with industrialization is the reason it is such a disruptive and violent process, which is why, you know, you had the great revolts of 1848, why you had the French Revolution and things like that is because that when you start industry, it is taking away a labor workforce from agriculture. It is changing the very nature of land holding patterns. It is challenging the status quo because you have new, uh, a, a sort of new feudal class arising in that sense that did not depend on agriculture. It is challenging the status quo, the power structures and things like that. It is changing the life of people on the ground because initial industrialization is not nice for people. You know, in agriculture, you start from five in the morning, but you're going working your fields. Uh, you come back by five in the evening and you're so tired, you then go off to sleep. In industry, you may just be working for eight or nine hours, but the possibility for industrial accidents is a lot more. The workplace is unhygienic. You know, you're all cramped into a sort of urban squalor. And most importantly, you're not working for yourself. You're working for somebody else. You're not even getting a share of it. Even when you're an agricultural tenant, you get to keep a share of what you have grown. The difference is that industrialization will always give you results. Agriculture, you don't know when the market is going to collapse, when the monsoon is going to collapse, when the floods are going to uh, destroy the fertility of your crops. Uh, when the snow is going to come too early or the rain is going to come too early and break your crops, uh, when a disease is going to come and destroy your crops, when locusts are going to come and eat your crops, uh, when rats are going to come and infect your crops. It's a high, high uncertainty, uh, uh, high risk venture, which industrialization isn't. So even in that, it was a deeply disruptive process. The second thing that you see is initial industrialization, it actually lowers the living standards of the peasantry somewhat because urbanization leads to squalor, which is not as healthy a lifestyle as say living out in the villages and things like that. The third thing is that initially it adds to the power of your crony capitalists. Their power actually goes through the roof. Like you see with uh, the Americas, like you see with Britain, uh, isn't it amazing that the greatest period of highway robbery was also coincidental with the earliest period of industrialization? And it is sort of to combat that, that the state monopoly on violence takes over. Because the population dependent on agriculture is so much, and your agricultural yields are reducing. People are moving towards industry. So the resource competition actually goes up and you need much more effective means of violence management than you had in the past. Centralization in that sense, planning, decision-making. Now, what we have in India today is we've got too many PSUs and crap like that. We've got too many paper pushers doing paper jobs. But where are the people doing real jobs? Your cops are a total of what? 300 to 500,000 max. You've got the lowest police to human ratio on earth. And those are the people actually going out and doing the actual job on the field. They are not the ones sitting in government offices and stamping things, which can be done much more efficiently. And we need to probably reduce about three quarters of them. 
right? You need a police force that needs to be 10 times bigger. You need a police force of at least about three to four million people. Right now you have about 300 to 500,000 odd people. So you need a 10X is to about 6X to 10X increase in your police force. Second, what you need to focus on is regulatory mechanisms. And regulatory mechanisms is what prevents the tyranny of the rich that you see in early industrial societies. We again don't have that. You have courts that are so not clear, just like our hist historians aren't clear on what industrialization is or how Britain industrialized. You have our courts that take three months to decide that inconveniencing other people through sit-ins like Shaheen Bagh or blockades like uh, the farmers' protests are illegal. If a judge does not know this instinctively and can't rule on this within a few seconds, understand how weak the training in your fundamental legal principles is. Understand what a joke your rule of law is. This is a very, very serious problem. If a Supreme Court takes three months to decide that squatting and causing public inconvenience is illegal, then you have a very, very serious problem. Well, you, you can't question judiciary, Abhijit. It's a completely meritorious institution. There are no reservations. No, we all know it isn't. I think if you look at the... There are no reservations that. in media. There are no reservations in judiciary. No, no, but uh, what, 70 to 90%, 70 to 90% of all the judges, their parents were also judges. Let's not forget that. So, you know, in that sense, it's almost like the same privilege robber baron era that we're looking at uh, abroad. Very problematic. So this brings us to the state monopoly on violence. And this is where a lot of these wokes and lefties get confused. This is called isomorphic mimicry. You take a reality in another, another country and then you cut and paste it onto your own country. What people don't realize is when they move from agrarianism to industrialization, the state monopoly on violence became absolute. The state's control of affairs became absolute. It had to become absolute because industrialization is such a horrible process. Like I said, Britain in the 1700s lost a quarter of its population. France lost so many people and such horrendous inequality, which is why you had the French Revolution. Uh, Stalin, when he forced industrialized Russia, causes the Holomdor and things like that. Britain, when it forced industrializes Bengal into a war economy to meet the demand against the Japanese coming in, causes the Bengal famine. Right. Now you need a strong government to do that. You need the state monopoly on violence to do that. In India, we have never achieved that. The EU has a more integrated financial and economic policy than India does. States in India have more financial power than constituent members of the European Union do. The European Union is India minus the military integration. India is the European Union minus the economic integration. That's a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> but you know, uh, uh, let's say coming to the post-independent India, then they had to try to do it, this whole fancy five-year plans. After that, we kind of abandoned it. Now we are again trying to push for it with different kinds of schemes. Do you think that India can ever industrialize? Uh, let me let me put it in a more uh, proper manner. I mean, we we are one of the uh, we know very we have very sophisticated industrial base in this country. We do have uh, industrial production one of the largest. But can India ever become an industrial society? This is the proper way of asking. Uh, no, we can't, and I'll tell you why. Because we had institutions. You create institutions before representation. We gave representation before institutions. Okay, uh, too many people, and this is unfortunately where Amitabh Kant was absolutely right. I know everybody outraged about it. Uh, of course, I don't think there's something called too much democracy. Democracy is a negotiated process, right? Uh, it, it's not a copy, cut, paste process. In India, we never negotiated the process. See, it, it was just a Westminster system that we cut and pasted onto the Indian reality by people who were lawyers who went anthropologists. Whereas in other countries like, say, uh, Germany, Japan, and all these countries, they worked through their processes. They you know, negotiated the social reality of their time rather than being protected by a British viceroy to come up with an unrealistic document, which then necessitates the First Amendment almost instantaneously because 
the constitution is on the verge of collapse because of property rights and uh, uh, things like that. So it's a very, uh, again, this isomorphic mimicry that happened with our constitution. Uh, Ayub Khan was on the right track in Pakistan, industrialized till Zulfikar Ali Bhutto sort of derailed him with the war because he didn't want Ayub Khan getting too powerful. So he kind of instigated that 1965 war and got rid of Ayub Khan. Uh, but uh, with us... I mean, explain that you just made a very interesting claim out there. So this, uh, this is on record. This is on record. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto gets asked uh, why did you start the 65 war when you knew you had no chance of victory, when India-Pakistan relations were just fine in the sense there was no hostility? And he said, damn you, man, that was the only way of getting rid of the military. So he literally wanted to force the military into a war they would lose so that he could come to power and get rid of the military. Right. And, that, and then he brings in socialism. Again, cut, copy, paste which doesn't work. You haven't created enough of a wealth surplus to then distribute it. He starts distributing it and then he fails again. So in India, what happens is uh, we have too much representation, uh, too many rights and not enough duties. And that fundamentally becomes a problem. Your institutions aren't strong enough. You don't have law and order. Your regulatory mechanisms are a joke. Uh, your judiciary is... Well, no contempt of court, but just insert some words out here, whatever comes to your mind. Uh, your uh, 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 lawmaking processes are a joke. Your statistical collection is the biggest sham anywhere in the third world. I know African, uh, I know less developed African countries that have better statistical collection than the Indian statistical collection process. All the statistics are hidden. And why are they hidden? Because they're not actually collected in a proper way with scientific rigor. So, you know, bureaucrats can feed crap to their ministers and give them concocted statistics. Which is why one of the biggest issues that people face in this country when researching it is the lack of statistics. I can tell you at ORF, for example, when I was there, we collected about the bot. We bought at a pittance the data of about 24 or 30 different government departments. And this is such extraordinary data. It wasn't done like marketing agencies that would do 2,000 houses, 3,000 houses, households or things like that. This was about three to 500,000 households, three to five lakh households. Each one of these 24 to 30 departments had carried out their own census uh, uh, surveys, all of which was stored in incompatible code. Not one of these censuses talked to the other. They didn't even know what to do with it after that. They collected the data and wasted the data, which is why they sold it to us for a pittance. I agree. I agree. This is a standard problem in Indian data collection. And mind you, this isn't happening once or twice. This is 24 different government departments sanctioning extraordinarily expensive data collection without understanding what to do with it or how to code it in a similar fashion. You don't even have government standards on statistics. You don't have government standards on coding statistics. You don't even have a proper government centralized statistical survey. In Australia, you've got the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which is a, an entirely independent department. It's a government. But what it does is it earns its money. It gives the government data for free. But anybody else who wants data, especially companies coming in and things like that, they pay for the data. And so they get very accurate market risk analysis. Here you don't. So I mean, what do you do? In this country, we don't even have an NRC. We don't even know who our poor people are. We don't have a population database. We don't know how many migrants do we have. And as something as basic uh, for a modern state like NPR, NRC, is opposed on the streets by the violent thugs. And, 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 you know, the problem in all of this is you don't even have a basic agreement on what constitutes democracy. Your people just keep concocting, apparently burning tractors is democracy, blockading roads is democracy, you know, uh, not allowing traffic to pass is democracy. And, and notice this goes back to the area of Irfan Habib who doesn't understand what industrialization is. So, you know, this kind of illiteracy passing off, if your greatest intellectual gems are so illiterate, uh, 
then you have a serious problem because ultimately if the intellect of a society are rotten apples, then the rest of your uh, society are compost apples. They've gone past the rotten stage. Now that is classic Abhijit speaking. So, <laughs> so coming to the point, can, can India really industrialize in the 21st century? Can we ever achieve that China dream of becoming the manufacturing hub of the world? No, or as I, I would say, we become a Vishushudra before <laughs> you are talking about Vishuguru, because what is there to learn from you anyways? Um, it, look, that boat has now sailed on up enough. Because you know what is now happening is you're seeing a great push towards the way you industrialize you is you start off low. It doesn't matter what you compete in, it matters on how you compete, right? China didn't start off with mobile phones. China has gotten to mobile phones. It started off with toothbrush, toilet brush, uh, uh, commodes, uh, 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 dhoneka uh, mugs, okay, uh, buckets, tube lights. Uh, plastic chairs, and still they became a great industrial power. In India, when you start off a program like Make in India, the person in charge of Make in India is so confused about if it is about indigenization or if it is about jobs. When the prime minister announced it, it was clearly about jobs, it wasn't about indigenization, but the person in charge of it has on repeated occasions confused jobs with indigenization. Then there is this great fetish we have for we want high tech jobs. As if you know, manufacturing a factory floor worker who manufactures a BMW uh, is different from a guy who manufactures a bulb. They are. But you know, to manufacture a BMW today, the amount of industrial training you need to have. Why is it that only Germany is producing these kind of cars? Why is it that Mercedes, Audi, uh, a BMW all come from Germany. There's a reason behind it, right? Why is Ferrari only made in Northern Italy, not in Southern Italy? Think about it. It's because the human capital invested there is so much. Today, in the schooling system, you spend $76 per student per year. Tell me, how are you going to get a BMW factory assembly at $76 per person per year? A German worker has about $38,000 per year invested in him just in his education. Not to mention the industrial training after that, which is about $60,000 to $100,000 per person. $100,000 is what? Uh, uh, 1 lakh rupees, uh, 72 lakhs per person per year that you are investing in one BMW worker. Where si will BMW in this country? No, no, we are going to make Rafal, you know, we can make Rafal, HL can. Not happen. Not happen. And, and this, this is what worries me. This is what worries me that this lack of social knowledge, this lack of anthropological knowledge, this lack of knowledge of industrial history, this lack of how understanding how your nutrition, your health, your uh, education segment all play a role. And, you know, nutrition does play a role in your industrialization. Uh, because today we are looking at almost 40% malnourishment in this country, which actually retards intellectual growth. It retards your cognitive ability. People forget this. It also makes you more violent. A Rottweiler, if you feed it too much protein, becomes more violent. A human being, if you feed it less protein, tends to become more violent because then you're facing a scarcity and you need to get more uh, 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 nutrition out. And the problem with that kind of uh, cognitive deficit that builds up because of malnutrition lasts three generations. So you're condemning not just you, you're also condemning your children and your grandchildren to that cognitive deficit, which then takes 70 years to rebuild and there's nothing realistically that can rebuild it. So you know the kind of mental damage we're causing to our population, which prevents, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the investment in money. We're not even going to the mental damage you're causing to your population that is preventing industrialization. Okay, all of this is so cumulative. The problem set has now increased manifold. Now, why Nehru failed to do it, I guess, is because the disruption was so great. He also didn't allow private companies to do it. Private companies should have made their own money doing it, made profits doing it. No. Uh, so like Modi's na khaunga na khani dunga, it was na karunga na karne dunga. 
right? He didn't have the money to do it. Every time he'd run out of money, he'd start a new wave of nationalizations and seize other people's money that wasn't his. And then he'd run all of them into the ground because they'd all start becoming bankrupt. He would take off profit-making enterprises and make them bankrupt within a period of three to four years. In that sense, you know, Nehru's industrial policy was exactly like Hugo Chavez or Nicola Maduro's industrial policy. The industrial policy of a truck driver and a failed uh, 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 military colonel. Okay. Uh, but, you know, you can uh, uh, rent, uh, rent a historian always does wonders for you. All you need to do, like Napoleon used to say, you know, history is a set of lies agreed upon. You just need to take these uh, early rental historians to write hagiographies about you. And essentially, they will portray a man whose intellect was no greater than that of a truck driver as that of Socrates or Aristotle. Uh, you can do that. And we have been doing that in this country. So mm -hmm. our eminent historians, as I always say them, I'm saying it for years since my JNU days, they are communist, communal, court historians of the Congress. And that's it. This is that's what our eminent historians are. But you know, uh, you just pointed out that we don't understand the anthropology, we don't understand history. And still in India, we have so much of hostility towards the social sciences, especially what you call as the right wing. These people are, you know, just shut down social sciences. I mean, what explains this hostility to knowledge itself? Because, and then you go and crib about that, you know, that the Westerners are defining us, they are doing sociology, they are doing anthropology, we don't have any indigenous model. How can you have any indigenous gaze when you don't even want to invest in the education? What, why this hostility towards the uh, uh, social sciences? So, you know, there's many uh, issues with the uh, right wing in India. Uh, the first thing is, you know, this uh, uh, tendency to look to the past it's usually a sign of an extreme inferiority complex. You tell me which Western country builds monuments to its past. It did it during the age of colonization, but ever since they entered the information age or the late industrial age, they're always looking towards the future. They're not looking towards the past. Have you noticed this is a constant theme? Indians want to look back to Ram Rajya. ISIS and Al-Qaeda want to look back to the Rashidun Caliphate. Okay, now as much as people find that comparison odious, the mentality that it comes from is the same. You are so despondent, you are so powerless, you feel so impotent and inferior today that you want to go back to an imagined good old days. And this is classic of an agricultural society because in an agricultural society, there was no scope of growth. Like we discussed what the sun radiated onto earth, only that would be produced you couldn't have, you, you would maybe one year you'd have a bumper harvest, but that's about it. Otherwise, your harvest would be the same. So you looked back to an imagined good old days, which were actually not that good at all. Uh, you just glorified them to a point. Uh, industrial societies don't do that. So th that is number one. The second thing is you look at all these sciences that are coming up anthropology, you know, forensic archaeology. Uh, archaeological economics. These are all modern sciences. These are all modern post-industrial sciences. They did not, you did not have a forensic archaeologist in the Vedic age. There was no job description called forensic archaeology. There was no job description called anthropologist. Right. And their belief, so driving from point one is they believe that if these jobs did not exist in that age, there is no need for them in this age. The third problem is because the left tends to dominate the humanities and these people can't express themselves clearly. Every time they open their mouth, they end up looking like monkeys. You know, there's this very famous uh, uh, cartoon of Charles Darwin. Uh, because, you know, when Darwin came up with the theory of evolution, Britain got really scandalized by it. And there is this picture of the uh, of a gentleman's club where everybody is sitting in a, a, a tuxedo, smoking cigars and drinking cognac. And a chimpanzee comes through the door dressed in a, uh, dressed in a tuxedo saying, hey, apparently I'm related to you, let me in. This is how they used to make fun of Charles Darwin in those days. And in many ways, because the right can't master these subjects, 
refuses to. It can, because technically, if you look at it, anthropology favors the right. Sociology does not, because sociology is basic, uh, you know, airy fairy gobbledygook layered onto anthropology. It's, it's actually the way mercantilism disrupts pure capitalism. Sociology is the garbage that disrupts proper anthropology. And the problem with our people is that their inferiority is so great because remember saying, I don't know, are the bravest three words in the English language according to me. It takes great courage to say, I don't know. In India, we hate saying, I don't know. This is why I never talk about sports. I never talk about movies. I never talk about, uh, you know, uh, 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 I don't talk about a lot of subjects because I don't know, right? Uh, here, because we lack the nuance, that inferiority complex becomes worse and worse. And you claim that this entire stream of thought is quackery, it is un-Indian, and we don't need it. And that is highly problematic. I, I've heard, I mean, recently, uh, I've heard someone saying from what you call the right wing in India, that what was wrong in the Stone Age? Were not people happy in the Stone Age? I mean, he's that, you know, agrarian, he's an advocate of agrarian society. Our cities are bad, industrialization is not good, so let's go back to the village and so on. And one more girl, you know, uh, being educated in the sciences, she actually, she was actually talking something and I countered her about something and she got really angry and she said that, you know, uh, what has the modern world given us? What has the technology given us? See one pandemic and all the advanced countries are down on their knees and uh, what progress have we made? I was like, my goodness, I mean, this is the mentality in the 21st century among the people who are among the, the cream of the society because they are getting PhDs in sciences and from IITs and so on. I, I normally feel very hopeless on these things, but we don't know what is going to happen. But let's say it's, it's, a, it's a very complex and long discussion, Amajit, but we talk about India. We often do not talk about other parts of India, which are no longer India, which is Pakistan and Bangladesh, mm -hmm. right? So I always say Pakistan is simply India under Islam. So. <laughs> What's happening in Pakistan and Bangladesh with respect to industrialization? You talked about Ayub Khan. What has been their trajectory and why is Bangladesh performing better now? Right. So it's actually three historical snapshots. Pakistan is Mughal India. India is post Mughal India. Uh, Bangladesh is post India India. Okay, and I'll tell you why. Uh, with Bangladesh, you have this whole uh, thing where, you know, they endured Pakistani rule and then they sort of moved on to uh, more, uh, they went through turmoil and ever since Khalid Azia has come, what are the things that have been achieved? Khalid Azia has seen to it there is no opposition left. She's essentially dictatorialized society. Sheikh Hasina. Sheikh Hasina. Oh, sorry, Sheikh Hasina. Sheikh Hasina. Sheikh Hasina has ensured this. And what happens is she has been able to introduce, she, she's, uh, if you actually talk to people in Bangladesh, they'll tell you that, you know, she's so astounded by corruption in her own country that she's decided she's going to reduce government interference in everything. So she sort of deregulated the ceramics industry and the ceramics boomed. They overtook India in no time at all. Today, Tata ceramics are mostly made in Bangladesh. Then she sort of deregulated the textile sector and now that's taken off. Very soon, she's going to deregulate the energy and gas sector and that is going to take off. Okay. This is what happens where it's, it's, it's in that sense you can say that Sheikh Hasina is to Bangladesh what Ayub Khan was to Pakistan. You know, there's a very famous, I think it was an R.K. Lakshman cartoon in um, uh, Pakistan in 1977. No, before, during Ayub Khan's time. I forget who made that cartoon. But it's two dogs talking across a fence, an Indian dog and a Pakistani dog. Uh, the Indian dog is on the point of starvation. The Pakistani dog is looking very healthy and fat. And it says to the Indian dog, um, I can eat as much as I want. 
and the indian dog replies i can talk as much as i want right now now let's go to pakistan pakistan is mughal india it is the same structures of governance that the muslims left in place that feudal uh, you know medieval structure with a very strong elite class that control everything massive resource capture today the fauji foundation apparently owns which is the military's foundation which is and remember the military there you have this nexus of landowners industrialists and military all the military come from land holding families and things like that or well to do families or the families and you know we shouldn't confuse social mobility anatol levin who's written this brilliant book uh on pakistan pakistan a difficult country you should remember he wrote it based on pakistani government military grants he used to keep getting first class tickets and things and it he tries to portray the army as being a great institution of social mobility it is not it is a great institution for social mobility within a class structure a minor noble can become king but a peasant cannot become king remember that okay it's all within the jhund it's restricted to those 2 300000 families that control everything uh now what happens with all of this is 90% 90 to 95% of your economy is in the hands of these 100 200 300000 families this is how the mughal empire would have looked today had it continued uh india is post that the british come they don't really change the mughal system the hindus move on because for them this freedom from the feudal system suits them fine the muslims never move on they keep after the 1857 revolt in fact they doubled down on it and they hold on to the feudal system which is why they become a vote bank because it is still a few feudal leaders controlling the voting patterns so you win them over you get their votes kind of thing right but we're also a country that did not do what bangladesh did which is have a strong government which could then implement the policies required to industrialize which is why of course bangladesh is uh, good because it's a more or less a homogenous society you know one language uh, kind of thing there's no real debate about the role of islam and things like that they've determined who they are in india the question still remains who are we because our definition of who an indian is isn't determined by our ethnicity it's not determined by our language it isn't determined by our religion it isn't even determined by our culture i'm talking about the constitutional definition uh it is determined by one party struggling against a foreign invader that is india's definition of india today the congress party's self image of itself is the idea of india and see that never works if you look at a linguistic society like germany or japan it's an eternal principle as long as the language lasts the idea of a nation will last if you look at a country like america as long as it's based on an idea a better future for all the american dream it's a permanent identity what is your identity in india uh, an ossified so called freedom struggle against a so called foreign occupier at some point of time even that 90% of it is a concoction because you didn't win your own history hitler won your uh, hitler won your independence for you technically uh, but i mean you want to pretend that it was all this uh, nara bazi and all of that that won you your independence congratulations to you like i said self delusion is the uh, uh, india's greatest export should be self delusion nobody even uh, you know uh, james cameron doing avatar can't come up with the kind of illusions and delusions that the indian mindset can if you have this kind of a notion where are you going to go which is why pakistan will always remain more backward than india but bangladesh is moving forward quite rapidly they have other problems in about 10 to 15 years those problems will also come home to roost especially population pressure and things like that uh, but sheikh hasina is going about it in a very very smart way she's going about it in a consensual way she's not ruffling too many feathers she's doing it in an extremely smart move let's see 
Yes, I mean, let's see what where the sub, Indian subcontinent goes in the future. But it's a very long topic. It's a very complex topic. People, industrialization is not something we can cover in one podcast. So I hope we will continue this discussion in the coming months. And uh, thank you, Abhijit, for your time and for your, uh, you know, expert uh, commentaries on Indian judiciary and Indian society, which everyone loves on the YouTube, by the way. So I did not make any comments on the Indian judiciary. I just said fill in the blanks and you fill in your own uh, adjectives. <laughs> That's more than saying, you know, what you wanted to say. But I I log apna apna fill in the blanks karte. How can I be held responsible for it? You don't know Indian judiciary. They can hold you responsible for anything. If they well, I know the Indian judiciary. That's why I asked people. To, uh, trust so, me, I've been a victim of Indian judiciary, <laughs> and I've been a victim of the so-called Chief Justice of uh, the Chief Midget of India. But anyway. Okay. Anyways, uh, thank you. Thank you, people, for your time, and see you next time. Thank you.